185 miles south a hardcore punk rock podcast All right, this is recorded on April 27th, 2019, and today we got the big dog, the mayor of Oxnard, Tony Cortez, the guitarist of Ill Repute. Thanks so much for coming today. Oh, man, thank you for having me. This is uh, an honor. Yeah, I'm so stoked. Uh, you know, the idea for doing the podcast was I listened to a couple punk rock podcasts, and uh, there was this guy, Damien, he, uh, he's a singer of Fucked Up, and... Uh, he used to talk a lot about the early mystic stuff and I emailed him. I was like, dude, you got to email or you got to interview Tony, you know, and I never heard back. And so like, that was kind of like the impetus. Like, you know, if you, if you're telling someone else what you want them to do, just shut the fuck up and do it yourself, you know? Right, right. So I wanted to document a lot of the nard guys. And of course I want to get the white whale, Doug Moody, but uh, mm -hmm. I've already, I've talked to him and, and he turned it down. He said he has his own podcast but it's legit dog shit. <laughs> like, yeah, <really? laughs> it's hard, dude. It's like not on iTunes or any of those. Well, I want him to like lay everything out because even like the pre-punk stuff is like really interesting. And in like the early eighties, like he, he was just kind of throwing everything against the wall. Yeah, you and, know? Yeah, and you know, the problem with that too, though, is, is, uh, I don't know what to believe out of his mouth, man. You know, he'll sell you, he invented the compilation. Oh yeah! Tell you he uh, did all this stuff, and it's just like, oh my god! Dude, dude. He told me that he was there when they decided to uh, carpet the floors in recording studios because you'd you'd be recording and everyone would be tapping their foot, uh -huh. and it would cut into the recording. And, and, and he probably went, you know, what we should do, we should carpet these. Yes. Like, <laughs> so he invented the compilation, the compilation, and the idea to carpet the acoustics. He invented. That's right. Yeah. So in the early eighties, he was just throwing everything in the wall. And there's some really interesting stuff in there. Like he did like a Fernando Valenzuela, like picture disc, uh -huh. seven inch. It's like, okay, that's so cool. You know? And it's like a, like a banda band, you know? Yeah. It's really, yeah, really neat. Anyway, let's jump into ill repute. Um, the demos, he did two demos in 82. Did he start the band before that? When do you think uh, he started? Well, yeah, we, we started the band just kind of like on a whim, and we literally, I knew how to play guitar a little bit just from kind of just self-taught, you know, uh -huh. uh, and uh, just, just we saw people doing it, but, you know, Jim never played bass before, uh, nobody sang, of course, and uh, so we just kind of did it because we went to a gig in LA and we met people, and they're like, well, I have a band. And what year do you think this is? Uh, it's probably 80... 81 okay either late 80 early 81 mm -hmm. then I, like i think we say the band was officially formed november 81 okay is when we actually were the four members that were on the recording which was jim callahan john faniff and carl valdez and myself and uh so when we four finally had like a coherent project uh -huh. that's when we consider so that was probably november 81 yeah that's and then so you, you just you recorded demos shortly after and they're fucking awesome. It's amazing because like I think the doctor know the early stuff with Brandon is really good, but like the Stalag demos aren't super like thought out yet. But those okay. ill repute demos is like this is a fucking legit band like already. <laughs> well, I don't know. Do you have that that record that has all the demos? The Igby just did. I don't, yeah, I, yeah. I don't have the uh, the Grand Theft Auto one. It's the same thing, right? It's the same thing. Yeah, but that's just DVD. And this one's vinyl. Yeah. Different artwork and stuff. So cool. But there was actually two sessions. Yes. So Aggression went to this place called Goldmine, and they did a thing, and then we, they told all the punk bands about it, and we're like, oh, yeah, we can do that. It was like eight hours for $100. Mm -hmm. And so we go down there, and it's these rock and roll guys. They know nothing about punk, but they did Aggression. But Aggression, you know, they're a little bit more half and half, you know? Yeah. And they know what they're doing. They knew how to play. Yeah, they knew how to play. Yeah. They knew how to tune their guitars. <laughs> right. Which is, which is part of the story. So we go in there, and the guy goes, okay, what do you want to do? And we go, we want to do all these songs. We have like 40 songs. No shit. Do, or, or, yeah. You know, like 20 songs. And the dude's just like, what? Really? <laughs> and then, well, I'm just going to fucking turn the tape on, and you guys go. And so we just played, you know, exactly like we practice in the garage or whatever. So we just played. 
and uh, the only overdubbing was probably maybe some leads and some vocal and vocals. And the thing is, it wasn't. We didn't have a tuner back then. We tuned by ear. Yeah. And it was all shit. So it, it, you'll you'll hear some of that shit on there. But it was. But all the passion was in. But you that. guys are tuned together. Like you guys tune together, right? Like it might it might not be in perfect E, but it's like it doesn't but sound it's like shit. The same to each other. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? But I mean those demos they're awesome. Some and I I think it's a No, I meant some of the songs were in tune. Some yeah. of them were Okay. <laughs> but you must have been practicing a shit ton. Because oh, we, it sounds really dude, tight. We loved it so much that we literally any free time we had we were practicing. Cause because we just hang out in Carl's garage and he had a big garage with a couch and all the old school heads would come and just sit there and watch us play. It was like a party. Yeah. And we would just practice as much as we could. Like and what part of town was, week. what part of town was Carl in? Uh, you know, the cover of, uh, Land of No Toilets, uh-huh. that J street ditch. He lived on J street right there. Oh, uh, cool. And that was literally across the street from his house. Cool. We were, we just walked out of the garage, hopped the fence into the ditch yeah. and, and spray painted them the ditch and took a shit. I mean, <laughs> pretended I was taking a shit and then took the picture. Oh, that is so cool. With, uh, with talking about the old heads, I think we should actually circle back before the demos. Cause I thought it was really interesting. You put out the, uh, the Narcor 20 years later comp, 25 years later, 30 years, 30 years later. Yeah. yeah. And I remember I was like, I think it was like 20 years or something or 25, but it said 30. And it's because you circled back and, and gave credit to the rotters. Right. That are uh, like a 77 band from Camarillo or 78. 78. Probably, yeah. 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 Which, is, which is amazing to me. And I have like the utmost respect for the rotters. Yeah. Just because, I mean, they were literally getting bottles thrown at them. There was no one paving the way. I mean, they had the the early English stuff and the and uh, but there was nobody out here doing it. Yeah, they were, they, they just are freaking huge props. Yeah, and the uh, I mean that sink the whale song is a ripper. Yeah, sink the whales and buy Japanese goods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's so good. And yeah, of course, uh, sit on my face. Yeah, like, just, I mean that's just so offensive and good. Yeah. So <laughs> I thought that was really cool because. You know, in punk, a lot of it is uh, giving credit to the ones that came before you. And it's like, man, even C- Tony Cortez is throwing back. Like, that's so cool, <laughs> you know? So I had a question about the demos. And uh, because there's a big difference between the demos and what happens next in the drumming. And maybe I should be asking Carl, but it was like, on the demos, you're still playing like a, like kind of a normal fast beat. Like, do that, do that, do that, do 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 that, you know? Okay. And then it's like, what happens next, like, you guys discovered speed and it's so much faster. Like then he's like, then he's really going. That was probably Carl's progression was cause when we got Carl. So, so me, John and Jim, we, uh, I, I don't know when I say discovered punk rock, it's not like we discovered punk rock, but when we discovered what punk rock was, it was like, wow, you know, you just, uh, it's like a light switch on and off. And yeah. It was just, and Henry Rollins is a great, uh, uh, stand up. Uh, spoken word about about when you and it and it's exactly the way it felt what what he says anyway everything else was just went out the window is just shit it was just like oh my god this is revolutionary when it clicks with you you just know and and it was so we got so we're we dove into it head first and we went to shows and stuff and then when we decided to do the band we're like okay uh we need a drummer we don't know any fucking drummers. Yeah. And I go, well, we know Carl, but Carl was a total rock guy, you know, okay. Boston, knew nothing about punk. And so we played some stuff for him and he goes, and he literally told us, this is, this isn't real. The drummers can't play this <laughs> And it wasn't even the fast, hardcore stuff. Right. It was like the, you know, early black flag stuff, sure. and, which was, you know, hard and fast, but not, yeah. but not, not Boston that hardcore. Fast yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Know, yeah. Hardcore fast. So, it was probably just Carl's progression as he played and learned and then and, and grew into the punk rock world and, yeah. and hurt the other drummers and what they were doing. Yeah, it must I, I just wondered if like one night he heard negative approach and he was like, I gotta be able to do this. Right, you know? maybe. You know, yeah. I, mean, it's, 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 we, I think one of his defining moments was uh uh, red tape by the circle jerks. Oh, yeah. makes total sense. Yeah, he was yeah. just like this. That blew his mind. The drumming on that song. Yeah, well, circling back to that other podcast, the one with the guy from Fucked Up, he interviewed uh, Jerry A from Poison Idea, okay. and he said that red tape was like the whole. That's how they started the band. They're like, 
this is the craziest song ever. It's the last song on the Circle Jerks record. Yeah. We want to make a song where every song is this gnarly. Yeah, and the drums are just fucking full. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So then after that, after the demos, this is this has got to be pretty wild for you, right? So how did Rodney on the Rock find you and okay. choose you guys for that? Because yeah, so then after that, Clean Cut American Kid comes out on the third Rodney on the Rock LP. And that's in eighty two. Yeah, that's that, way early. That just blew our minds. So, so we're playing. I mean, and like I said, we were practicing constantly, playing every party we could play, playing every show that would have us. And then we started playing in LA, the Cafe de Grand and stuff. But there was a uh, this this girl who was an LA chick with Oxnard ties, and her name was Meg. I can't think of her last name right now. But uh, she went out with Brandon for a while, best friends with Becca. Mm -hmm. And uh, she really liked us. And she said, I want to manage you guys, which we don't know what that really (laughs) was all about. But uh, she took our demo tape and she kind of knew Rodney or she didn't know Rodney. And uh, she gave the demo tape to him and he just played it. He liked it. He played it one day on the air. And I think it got a lot of uh, phone calls. So we kept playing it, and it just grew from there, which amazes us because it's, it's kind of a silly little song. I love the song. It's like, such a catchy wrong, song. Like it's just a fun. But how? I mean, how did that song, song even happen? Like it's so. I, I literally wrote it in the shower. I don't I, even know how. Uh, I just was just a hook know, came. Just shit, in my head just was always going on, and I was in the shower one day cleaning it, and I think because I was in the shower, clean cut, you know, was, yeah. was part of the in my head, whatever. That's so unique. I, I write almost all my shit in the shower. Okay. Yeah. I mean, do you think it's like a white noise thing? I, you know, possible. And the acoustics in there. Yeah, the acoustics are good. And yeah, and it's like you're shutting out the world and like, I don't know. Because, yeah, you're it's like. You're in your own head right there. Yeah, I just wonder if it's some sort of like, there's like a channeling there. Because like some senses are shut off. So you're able to like channel some shit. Because <laughs> writing songs is so weird, you know. It's like, it's got to be kind of like being an author. You don't. You can't just sit down and be like, I'm going to write the sickest thing ever. I was just and it's going to happen, that. right? It's like it's like you're opening up a portal in like your brain or your soul or something. And it's like you're channeling stuff in, right? Like stuff comes in and then it's on you to figure out how to like turn it into like real world art. Yeah, that's the hardest part for me. Like <laughs> I, I have fucking epic songs in my head. Then I pick up a guitar and it's just like, eh, 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 and I know. Fuck, nothing like it. You got to call Roger, man. But, <laughs> that's what I do. I, I call him and I sing the songs to him. Uh-huh. <laughs> and he's like, he's just a fucking genius. He can nice. like take oh, it. That's awesome. Yeah. I, uh, one of the things though too, is I think my best songs are not planned. Yeah. They just come to me. When I'm in a shower or, or, you know, I literally woke up and grabbed a piece of paper or grabbed my phone and did like the little, like into the recording. Yeah. I got to get this down. I just fucking thought of a song while I was sleeping Yeah, or whatever. And, uh, but if I actually try to write a song, like I said, they go, oh, I'm going to write a song. Yeah. And, uh, You're going to fail. It's a blank, yeah. It's a blank page. Yeah. So do you think the band's popularity went up after the Rodney on the Rock? Was that like a little bit of a breakthrough? Oh, absolutely. It yeah. was huge, huge. So, so we were like, we used to go to parties in Ojai. And uh, I remember we were at this party and they would always play, you know, Rodney because he was the only guy playing the, the good music. And uh, it fucking came on. And we were just, and we didn't know, like nobody says, hey, you're going to be on at this time. Right. And uh, we're just like, holy oh, fuck, shit. And everybody's like, listen. And then, then everybody's like, wow. And we're just like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, yeah, it really did open a lot of doors. And, and uh, I still am in contact with uh, Posh Boy Rodney. Yeah. I mean, not Rodney. Uh, goddamn, I'm going blank. The What's dude Posh from Posh Boy. Boy. I couldn't tell you. Rodney. Oh, no. Fuck. What the fuck's his name? Regardless, you're still in touch. That's cool. Yeah, we're still in touch. Still man. Matter of fact, he just. He's the one that got a clean cut on Stranger Things. Oh, yeah. Which was huge. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. That's that so crazy. crazy. That was and, another moment. And it's kind of amazing because, you know, well, I get right after is the We Got Power comp, which is like, other than Narcor, the best Mystic comp, probably. The first one of the We Got oh, Powers. We got power, yeah. yeah. You got Count the Odds on there. Um, because that, that was put together by guys. The you zine know, guys, the, yeah, scene guy, the zine guys. Yeah. But they were they were head first. Yeah, in the scene there. And yeah, they, you know, they got all those guys. Yeah, they still have a website up, and and everyone can download those for free if you go and and search for the We Got Power guys. Yeah, I think one of the one of the bands on there 
the one of the members actually went on to be in uh, either Pearl Jam. I believe it was Pearl Jam. Yeah. Huh. He's like the bass player in one of the bands on that one. <laughs> one of the 40 bands. Yeah, good like track. Yeah, good luck like tracking yeah, it down. I think that's Doug's whole thing. You know, <laughs> I'm going to fucking throw everything out there and I'm going to yeah. get something. Yeah. And then, so one thing I thought is crazy too is like you have this uh, success of the Clean Cut American Kid, which is like a super catchy song. And then you come out with like the Land of No Toilet 7 Inch, which is like super fucking hardcore. Balls like you're not, yeah, like you're not, you're not trying to like get another hit. You're just coming out trying to like melt faces. Yeah, we, we we literally never put thought like like that type of thought into whatever we're writing. Uh-huh. Everything, and I'm hoping I hate to like say things like this, but I'm hoping maybe that's why things resonated with us because everything is like from the heart, yeah, from our soul. Nothing's like kind of planned out to be a hit or to go this certain direction. Right. Yeah. You you weren't like teased by a little bit of that success and and chased it. Yeah. You just went back and. I think that your sound really started coming out on that record too, because you do a really good job with like, it's like the dark notes. I don't know how to describe it. Like the, like the intro to like sleepwalking stuff like that. Like you're, you're playing like kind of those dark notes, which is like a little different for like straightforward. Or that punk. Picking part yeah, or yeah. Yeah. I think that was heavily influenced by like TSOL and stuff. That's like true. Stuff they like were doing that. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And then that seven inch, well, okay, the We Got Power is associated with Mystic, but the Land of No Toilet 7 Inch is actually on Mystic. So how were you approached? Um, actually, I think what happened was Slimy Valley came first. Okay. And I, we came in to record a song for that. Whoever put together Slimy Valley. Okay. And I don't remember who it was, but whoever put together Slimy Valley – Threw our name in the mix. I was I was on the phone because I was trying to look up Posh Boy's name. <laughs> the guy's awesome and he's he's super uh, he's super cool. You know, like unlike Doug, he's been sending checks to us for one fucking song that came out, and he's sending us checks and stuff all the time. That's insane. Yeah, still. And, and BMI goes or whatever it is goes from that to us. Yeah, and we don't get anything like that from Doug. Of and course. Just from one song. He's, That's he's insane. Like, so I really was fucking pissed that I can't think of his name right now. Well, that happens. It's like you're trying to force a song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, exactly. we'll come up with it and we'll, we'll do an addendum. So anyway, back to uh, uh, the, your question about, uh, okay, so we got, uh, it came from Slimy Valley, okay. which was a comp based out of Seamy Valley. Yep. So a bunch of songs, how many bands were on that? You know? Again, probably like 30. Yeah, yeah. So um, we were one of the bands, knew nobody, uh, from Mystic or anything, got in there. I think we recorded that song at Mystic, and then they hit us up and said, "Hey, we really like you guys." And they probably said that to every fucking band that came in there. Sure, they just wanted to because they didn't pay for that record. We paid for that record. So you got a free recording, but you paid for the pressing. Uh, I don't even think that. You think you paid for the recording? Well, too. because we had no money. We were just these fucking scrappy punks. Of course, but uh, we had a friend. Mike Terry that just got an inheritance or something. It was just a high school friend, not in punk rock at all. And he was like, oh, I want to invest in you guys. And, and we're like, okay, cool, sure. And so I think he put up the money for whatever. And it might have, they might have worked out a deal between them. Like, you yeah. pay for this and we'll cover this. I have no idea. That's fucking hilarious. So if like, I mean, Doug is at that point, he's 60s. He yeah. was pretty old back then. Yeah, I mean, like, if he, he's in his 60s and taking taking a, a a wad of money from, like, a teenager, that's pretty hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? But 83 is early. Like, you guys, that is one of the first punk records on there. Um, I'm trying to think of what – well, everything else to comp before that. I think you're the first, oh, like, yeah. actual – Punk band. Yeah, that dehumanizes Mystic, us close. It was funny because Mystic had a thing where they would pull us in for every comp. Yeah. We're doing this comp. You guys got to be on it. Okay, boom. You're doing this. And I love that. I, I yeah. just love – I remember Social D uh, would have songs that were only <laughs> available on a comp. Yeah. It wouldn't be available on their records. And I was like, that's fucking great. I love that. It makes you get the comp. Yeah. You have to get the comp to get this song. And I tried to do that. And, you know – we just, it just usually just goes, well, we need it on a record, you know? Yeah. I mean, if it's a great song, it's a standout, yeah. you want to toss it on the record. But it's too. so cool to do that. Man. 
No, it's super cool. And it would have all been sucked into the omelet LP anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then the next mashup, and then Everyone. the next mashup, and the fifth mashup that we had knew nothing about. Yeah. So in 83, how is the Nard? Like, every band is like, I think all the, the big four, they all come out in 84, right? Uh, it was probably Plug- earlier than that. Okay. Yeah. Plug in Jesus is 84, right? And yeah, what happens next is 84. Dr. No was a band way before that. Sure. Yeah. But it's like, it's demos, right? Um, yeah, I guess Plug in Jesus would be their first. Yeah, the first record. record yeah, okay. yeah. And then uh, Don't Be Mistaken, 84. No, on, on BYO? Yeah. You think it's earlier? Probably earlier, but they were on that compilation. Someone got their head kicked in. That's before. Yeah, which was huge. Yeah. And that, that was really huge. That was cool. Um, and then In Control is 84. So... It's like that's the year of the Nard. So what's it like in '83? Like, there's so much like creativity because like you have these four bands, and I don't know how it is. I wasn't there, but in hindsight, you have like the four big standout bands, and they all sound so different. It's so rad. Yeah, it's pretty. You know, I hear that a lot, and I agree, and I fully agree. Everybody had their own flavor. It still kind of melded though. When so, so I hate to say different because. Because it wasn't really different. Everything melded really good, but everybody had their own flavor. Yeah. And and that was really cool. But, uh, you know, like, in the moment, you don't think about stuff like that. So I, I don't even know. It was just fun. I mean, it was just, we just went, just go, go, go. We yeah. just did whatever, played here, went to L.A. all the time, um, hopped in the back of a truck and toured across the U.S. without even thinking about it. But uh, when was the first time that happened? What was your first tour, Tony? I couldn't tell you the gate. God, I wish I could. But did you go? Was, was it was it after the seven inch or was it after the LP? It was probably um, the 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 land of toilets. Land of toilets, yeah. Holy shit! But that probably was a full blown US. We would do a lot of little, uh, maybe as far as Colorado and back. That's insane, though. And and it literally was in the back of a truck. Carl had a little mini uh, niece, not a niece, but Dotson or whatever okay. it was back then, or Ford Courier. Okay. And uh. Two people would be in the front. Two people would be laying in the back or sitting in the back because it was legal back then. With all the equipment. And then we'd have a shitty little trailer. Oh, you had a trailer for the equipment and stuff. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. The, one time we uh, in control, we had to play in Santa Cruz. And I can't remember what happened, but we had to go up in, like, Ryan's truck. And it just had, like, it was a tiny little, like, Nissan truck. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, two guys in the front. And then it was, like, the tiny little extended cab. You couldn't have like both guys even sitting up because we were all big guys. Yeah. yeah. So like one guy had to like lay on his back with his legs out the back window, <laughs> and then like the so other guy could kind of, yeah, the the other guy could kind of sit wow. comfortably. Like how far did you go like that? Santa Cruz. <laughs> so five six hours. Yeah. Oh fucking nightmare. But uh, yeah. And so then eighty four. What happens next? It's like such a I don't know well thought out album with like the sequencing and everything like it's like a it's a great hardcore punk record but it's like this whole fucking journey like you're taking them on the highs and lows how like well thought out was that or do you think that was a fluke it, it, oh, sorry. um it i'm not gonna say it wasn't thought out because there was a little bit of thought into it as far as let's play a couple fast ones then maybe you know the one of the more melodic ones will be here then we'll hit them with some more fast ones but not super thought out. Just just about like that. Let's just go. Oh yeah. It's just so I mean, it opens with Oxnard. That, that sure. was no brainer. No brainer. <laughs> yeah, we go. Can we open with this? And uh, I believe it ends with Cherokee, right? Yeah. yeah so that, both those those were just no brainers right there. And then the middle was just kind of like a okay, yeah, hit them hard and fast. Get do a little bit of melodic in the the middle. I think like don't get used would probably be like the third or fourth song. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then then close it out hard again. Whatever. Yeah, and you got Boogie Nights cover on that, which is one of the greatest punk songs of all time. Oh, thank you. That, that one always goes off. Yeah, who wrote it? I believe Jim actually wrote that. I wrote all the lyrics. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jim wrote the music to that. And sometimes, like, parts will be written by either uh, all of us, like the picking parts or whatever, or Carl thought of a couple of the, the cool intro things. Mm-hmm. Um, and John, too. And then, you know, we, we all had a mix in it. But, like, if you want to say the lion's share of the song, that one was by Jim, definitely. Awesome. 
Yeah, you probably. I mean, it makes sense, right? It starts with a bass part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's awesome, and, then, and that's what I like about the demos is like a lot of the demos are Jim songs. Yeah, they didn't make it to the record, and they're great songs that I wish. We I'm telling you. More. Yeah, me and me and Max, we came up here for for a thing a few weeks ago, maybe about a month ago. And on the drive home, we were listening to those demos because they're on Spotify now. Uh-huh. Um, I think they're on Spotify. They got to be. Igby's got his shit together. Yeah, I think so. Um, and we were fucking mind blown. Like, I, I had to have heard that stuff when, like, the Grand Theft Auto CD came out, but I don't remember. And, like, we're just like, this band is so, like, good in 82. Like, wow. all the songs, like, you know, like, there's very little filler. And you're right. Like, you know, people didn't see, but, like, Tony – he said we showed up with this many songs and rolled out like a, like a, like a, a long piece of paper. Right. There is like 40 fucking songs on there. <laughs> and for like, I mean, how old are you? 15, 16? No, no. You're older. 19. Then. You're 19. Yeah. All right. Okay. How old are you now? <laughs> Come on, Tony. Like uh, 55, man. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I might be 50. I seriously don't keep track. I could be 54. Yeah. I could be 56. So <laughs> you just got a range. Yeah. I'm 39. I was born um, in November 19th, 1962. So okay. whatever that is. Yeah, whatever that math is. Some, really someone get a calculator. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so awesome. Um, so you start touring. Did you, you did a full U.S. tour at some point. Yeah, yeah. And tell me uh, – well, let's talk about that. So what was your first full U.S. tour? Did you go by yourselves? Uh. Well, no, the first full U.S. tour, Eddie Numbskull set it up. Okay. Is when he was into promoting, and he was awesome, man. He, I I really feel like we let him down because of just all our fucking fuck-ups. On that tour? Uh, just throughout. Like, he wanted to be our, our representation, and, and it would have been really nice if we had it more together to give him what he needed so both of us could have, you know, sure. moved on. But uh, although he's doing fine without us, yeah. um, uh, but he put this whole tour together. You know, uh, actually gave us fucking notes like a booklet yeah. with all our tour dates and notes and funny little things yeah. and uh, and uh, like things that kept us entertained too. So uh, so he set up a whole U.S. tour, and that was the one that we did with Scared Straight. Okay, great. And uh, he uh, and how do you travel? Did you guys go in one van? van then. Was, were both bands in one van? That was the first full U.S. tour, though. Like I said, we did small yeah. ones. Um, so I think Jim had a van. Okay. And we took that. And Scared Straight traveled separate. Yeah, they traveled separate. And God damn, I push out a better memory. Do you remember the rooting? Did you I go out? I remember meeting some guy from Australia. at We, we, we went to uh, Scare, Sissimi Valley. Okay. Met Scared Straight. And there was this guy they had just met named Skippy. And from Australia, and he's going with us. Okay, sure. <laughs> and, and we all go. And uh, now the problem with that, that was our first booked U.S. tour, but we didn't make it because that's where we were in Pittsburgh. And we got uh, – we had a great show at this place called the Electric Banana. Super fun. Made a lot of, of uh, fans and friends. You know, when you put back then, when you played – you would just, we would just meet. We never, we never stayed at a hotel. Yeah. As always, you met people, had a party with them, went back to their house. They let you crash there. Yeah. Shower there. So these guys were having a huge party. So, and, and before that, every night somebody slept in the van. Yeah. And, uh, okay, we're going to go you know, sleep in the house. It's your turn to sleep in the van. And yep. the equipment. But they had this killer party and nobody, and we were just having such a good time. We all go in there and, uh, the next morning, Jim's Jim's all groggy, walking out. I think to go get his toothbrush or something. And he go and he goes out. And he's looking for the van, and he just sees this pile of glass <laughs> where, where our van <laughs> used to be. Yeah. And uh, and it's just gone. And then we're looking around, and we're in the shittiest fucking neighborhood. Yeah. I mean, it was like you know the beginning of good times. We watch it. <laughs> yeah. There's no curtains on the window because we, yeah. we drove around looking for a van to hold them. Maybe we'll yeah. see a band and after they took it to the store. Yeah, they ditched it. And uh, so we're just going, oh, fuck, this place is fucking is yeah. scary ghetto, man. Yeah. And uh, so uh, everything was gone. Luckily, that night was, was a one streak of luck was uh, I 
I had a bag that I kept all our money in. I think we had about $2,000 in there. From, from and you had it in the house. And I brought it in with oh, me. Oh, thank God. But I lost our itinerary. I lost all kinds of stuff. And all our equipment was gone. Sure. And then so we – but we are still, you know, touring and we're in Pittsburgh. And we go, well, let's let's go to the next show. We I think we had uh, – Eddie told us where the next show was or something like that. And uh, we tried it and it was like – the opening band was like some total garage band with like the worst equipment. And they're using their equipment now. Yeah, and we sounded like shit. And we were just, I think we went back. I think Scare Straight still went on a few more shows, but we just fucking put our tails between our legs and, and hightailed it home. Yeah. So we didn't make it. And then the guy from New York was this, uh, I forgot his name. He was a big New York promoter. Not big, but for the punk scene. Yeah. He was the main guy, Johnny Stiff or something like that. Okay. Remember that name? Uh, so I'm like, but well, he was so pissed at us. Like, but well, dude, don't you understand? We we lost everything. Yeah. Well, you got to get out here for this show, <clears throat> or your name is Mud in my town. Yeah, you know, shit like that. Yeah, I think he was just, you know, upset. That happened uh, when when Tony Queen a troll, and we ditched him in Texas and drove home. The Arizona promoter was like really pissed at us because we had to cancel like two Texas shows, Arizona. But then, like, we had enough time to get home, practice with a different drummer, and then drive to San Diego to do the last show of the tour. Oh, okay. And so that guy was irate with me. Like, he you're going to play bad. San Diego, but you're not going to come play Arizona? I was like, dude, there's only so much I can do, you know? Yeah. But and, and I get it, too, because promoters – but, you know, a good promoter, which he probably was because yeah. that's why why he was so upset. They put a lot of work into it. They literally put a lot of heart into it and stuff. Oh. And – uh you know, so I get it, but they got to see your side too. You know? I know if your van just got jacked. Yeah, you, know? you lost everything. Yeah, yeah. After we we did that Tony thing, you called me and you said you had a similar story, didn't you? Like you ditched a member somewhere oh, on the road. Yeah, that was during our big Rusty Balls tour. Okay. When uh, John didn't go on this tour, it was all set. It was all set up. Another one Eddie set up. Okay. And it was all set up and. Uh, and uh, there, there's, I don't want to get into this because it's the, the whole. No, no one in the band can agree what happened then. Okay. But for some reason, John didn't go on tour, and we decided to go without him. And that was tough. So I, so I was playing guitar and singing. Are you three piecing them? Well, no. So what we did was we would get another because I couldn't do it. I couldn't. Yeah. I, ha- I had to be able to play. Uh be able to kind of drop out and play or sure. play real basic. Sure. Uh, so we had to get another guitar player. So we got Mike Vallejo from Circle One. Okay. And he was great, but he could only do so much. And then we got some uh, – the guy we didn't even know named Eric, Jim Newf somehow from a friend of a friend. And we literally were teaching the songs in the band as we're driving to the thing. So it was rough. It was rough. And then we had an, – an, uh, he went. So, oh, so we had. Uh, I don't know. Do you remember Dave Jensen? No. There was a local kid named Dave Jensen, and he was a good, good guitar player. And we took him with us. And cool guy and everything, but he had you know issues. And it literally got to the point where his issues caused enough friction that we go, dude, you need to get it together. And you know, because his mind was somewhere else. And uh, we literally went, you know, dude, we can't take it anymore. Here, here's here's a bus ticket. Where are you? Um, in mid middle of the country somewhere. Who knows, Kansas maybe. Yeah, somewhere like that. Yeah. And we gave him a bus ticket, and and he went home and stuff. Then there was another time <laughs> where Ruben went with us, and Ruben's like one of my best friends. Okay. I love Ruben. And uh, matter of fact, we're doing a movie night this Sunday, where he's made a movie with Forrest is starring in it and stuff. And oh, great. Doing that this Sunday. If you're still in town, you guys should go to that. Um, but anyway, uh, him and Jim got in a fight. Oh. And they were kind of like, you know, you know when you're on tour. Of course. These fucking things get, get kind it's a of pressure rough. cooker. And again, we were like pretty far, a little bit past Midwest. And we're at a hotel. And these are the later tours when we wanted hotels now. We're like, sure, if we can afford, we'll stay with people at some places. But if we get a hotel, we're going to get a hotel. So uh, we're at a hotel and something happened between me and me and Carl are over here doing something. And uh, and Jim just comes in or we're going out to the van to pack up to go. 
and Jim's just start and Ruben's in the shower or the bathroom and, and Jim just starts putting Ruben's stuff on the ground going, Ruben said he's going to stay here. Let's go. And we're like, what? <laughs> and we're like, oh, okay. And we get in the van and then we, we knew, I mean, we probably should have said something. We kind of knew like, this isn't right, you know? Yeah. And then it turns out, yeah, no, he was just pissed at him and just left him there. Oh shit. And, so somehow we got to our next show. <laughs> he shows up. <laughs> Stabbed our fucking radiator. <laughs> we didn't know this. You know, we're inside playing. Yeah. But we're driving the next day and we're driving <laughs> and all of a sudden the, the van dies. Yeah. And it's just, and it was just like, <laughs> and we pull over the side of the road and then we look and there's a big hole in our radiator and we just go, fucking Ruben. <laughs> we knew right away. And half of me was like, uh, oh no. Okay. So. So we play that show. So like, like my, my memory's coming back yeah, as yeah. I'm telling the story. So we play that show. Ruben, I see Ruben. I go, dude. And he's all pissed. He goes, I go, dude, I swear to God, I didn't, I didn't know. And I go, I go, me and Carl goes, yo, we're going to buy you a bus ticket and get you home. So we took our band fund. We took him to the fucking bus station, drove him there, bought his ticket and gave him like a little bit of cash just to for like some food and yeah. stuff. And, uh, and then we went back thinking like, okay, cool. We, we, you know, we did the right thing. Finally, you know, a little bit of a fucking hiccup, but we did the right thing. So then we're driving yeah. the next day and that happens. We're like, fucking Ruben. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was going on. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So uh, after what happens next is the first Halloween live seven inch. And those are interesting. Like were they, they weren't live at a club. Like they were just, you recorded it live at the mystic studio. So this is how the Halloweens came about. Uh, Mystic Studios was right across the street from the cafe. Okay. And literally, literally right there. Like here was Mystic Studio building, the street, and the cafe was right there. And the cafe was was fun. It was just like this. It was like kind of um, whatever. whatever. They did how many people did it hold? God, someone told me if you go there now, you'll trip out. Like, or if you see footage of it, look it at it, just go, oh my God. It's, it was a small club. It was probably like Billio's. Yeah. But it was, uh, but I mean, Black Flag played there, Minor Threat played there, everybody played there. You saw both. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so anyway, we were booked to play there. Doug Moody walks over across the street from his studio, tries to get in, and, and, the shows there were like a dollar to three dollars. Yeah. And they wouldn't let him in for free. <laughs> and we were somewhere in the back. We had no guest list. I don't even think, you know, because we were probably like second from opening or something. Who knows? And Doug goes, sent someone in to get us and says, yeah, um, get out of there. We're, uh, they won't let me in or something like that. We're just like, oh, okay. So he pulled us off the show and he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a party at Mystic, I guess, to try to get back yeah. with them. And you guys play. We'll invite everybody over for free and we'll record it. And yeah. we're like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we did that. And yeah. That's how Halloween came out. And how many people were smashed into the studio? Uh, it was full. Yeah. I couldn't even give you a head count. But did you ever see that picture of El Ducci? Yeah. Passed out on the, 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 the. That's my favorite part of everything that came out of that night. <laughs> is he's fucking passed out on the couch, throw up right next to his face, and fully wrapped candies in his throw up. That he, you know, he fully wrapped. It's a psycho. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. But uh, so it, uh, I couldn't say how many. Probably like a hundred. Holy shit. Or less. You know? Yeah, that's insane. But it was packed and it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. And so after that is the Omelet LP. Now, were, did, were you guys cool with that? Like, was this one, like, ran by you? The, or the, the Omelet compilation. Yeah, we knew about that one. It was all approved. Except for the, the artwork. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the artwork, you know, um, I mean, they still showed us before it came out. And uh, we knew what they said. Yeah, we're putting together this compilation of this of your songs and do this. And yeah, we knew about that one. Yeah, and the, and the artwork, we we're just like, okay, you know, like, like we were kids. Like I kind of like the artwork for anyone but you guys. It's like I want that to be for a another band, but you know, because it's good art. Yeah, but it's just like not for ill repute. It makes it look like a joke band. We were just uh, we we're we we're flying past it. We we're just like, what the fuck is this? But you know, again, we were we were just 
in this world where everything just rolled. Yeah. We just rolled with it. Whatever happened, we just rolled with it. Where does that's what you guys want to do? Okay, sure. You know. Yeah, I mean that's those are packed years. You know, from eighty two to eighty five, it's like nonstop. You know. I I actually hated that album cover, but now it's just so funny. It's so weird. I just whatever. Yeah, you do a second Halloween live that comes out in eighty seven. That was actually the same recording. I'm pretty sure. Oh, so you just broke it's it up and did a second seven. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um. And then this one is definitely not authorized. Transition comes out in 89. Well, no, it, it it actually was. Okay, so we broke up. John went to guitar school. When What year do you think you broke up? I wouldn't even say broke up. We never really break up. So you take hiatus when? around when? Reba said he saw you in Nard in 86. When, when did Transition come out? 89. 89. Oh, so, so what happened? The reason, actually, no, this actually was a kind of a, not a breakup, but a, a conscious decision to stop playing. Was we started, we were playing Fenders a lot. And Fenders was great at first. I mean, big, huge shows with people from all, every, you know, all over. So what year is it and great? See, these are probably, it's probably 84, 85. Okay. Um, but like I said, I'm, I'm not positive. But so, so they, they were great and they, they, they start building and growing and then it just became, Fucking gang infested, uh, just an excuse to riot. Yeah. Just an excuse for the different gangs to meet. Nobody even caring what bands on stage. They would just, and there would be huge fights and riots, and uh, it was just disgusting. It was. Just, and that's like what eighty eight ish. Yeah. Right. So right before transition. Yeah. And so probably yeah maybe even eighty seven. And you guys never got tied up in any of that stuff, huh? Because, um. You guys went to LA all the time and you hung out with the Circle One guys and those guys are totally affiliated. But you never got sucked in? Yeah, no. We, as a matter of fact, uh, so man, I love the Circle One guys. Mike Vallejo, the band. Even John was a great person. He had issues, you know, how he all died and everything and his psychosis and stuff. And I think he got, he started like, Part of their, their following is one of the, the gangs started following him, like yeah. the Silmar gang. And I think he, he got just uh, kind of sucked up in that power yeah. of being untouchable with them behind him and stuff. And uh, that's what grew with that. But as a person before that, John was really good and really, you know, he had some fucked up moments, but he, he was, you know, I've never seen him get in a fight that wasn't provoked on him yeah and and uh until after maybe maybe when he started hanging got a little power hungry with those guys but i, I can't say for sure because i started distancing myself when it got like that you were able to stay away from all that stuff yeah because that's that's not me yeah and not honestly i mean you I, look at that's why oxnard and the, the scene here is so good we're not in it for that type of shit no everybody's in it for the fun and the, yeah and the, and the collaborations yeah and camaraderie and, yeah camaraderie that's yeah that. creativity um, so you decided to did transition then come a, out after you broke up? Yeah. So, well, no. So what happened was, so we called it quits and, uh, just kind of did our thing. John moved to LA, went to guitar school, learned guitar. Mm -hmm. So he came back this like really good guitar player. Right. And, uh, transition was before big rusty balls. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Years so, before. So he comes back and we go, you know, we're all missing playing and stuff. So let's, 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 let's play around with stuff. And, and, uh, so we wrote a few songs and things were kind of different because I think because that, that whole, and actually a lot of punk bands kind of took this, like Bad Religion came out with, uh, Suffer in 88. Into, no, no, before that. Oh, Into the Unknown into in the 85. Unknown. Every, all the punk bands were kind of like, okay, we did this. Now let's, let's kind of stretch mm -hmm. our wings a little sure. and see what we can do. And I'm not saying they were good ideas to do that. But, no, but a lot of bands but, uh, broke in weird ways. Yeah, seven seconds changed. <laughs> uh, and we didn't do it because they were doing it. It was just kind of something that happened. It was just kind of like a, we want to progress a little. And I think the violence of the scene maybe pushed everybody that way a little bit too. Um, so we, uh, so we just, yeah, try to, try to riot to let it be fool. <laughs> yeah. So we, tried, so we, uh, so we, yeah, we, we tried to, we had some stuff in there. So mystic says, Hey, you guys are, I hear you guys are playing again. Let's, 
the, they had a new studio down in Oceanside, and they called us down there, and we really weren't ready for it. But we go, let's just, okay, but again, we're still, let's do it. You know, we just hop on opportunities. So we go down there, and we just start playing songs. And it's it's just, um, some of it was okay. Uh, I literally walked out of the studio on some of them. I just go, I can't do this. Some of the songs I just go, you guys, if you guys want to record that, go for it. Um, John's playing guitar. He's good. He could he could cover, but. I can't be a part of some of this. <laughs> now, not to say that I fully poo pooed the project because you know that would be lying. I mean, we were having fun recording some of the things. Well, it sounds like you guys are jamming and having fun. It just doesn't seem like a cohesive LP. It's not. It's it's just pieces. Like I said, we weren't prepared to record. We had stuff we were trying and stuff, and we and uh, we literally kind of you know how bands go and uh, like real rock bands go and they record a demo, sure, and then they rewrite everything. They sit down and they rewrite it. That's what we thought we were doing. Yeah, if anything. That's that's the impression I was under. Yeah, and I mean, and then he, he just puts it out. So then, yeah, and then we were just like, uh, I, I walked out. Like I said, I walked out of the studio. Um, nobody was really happy with it. And then, like you said, instead of instead of saying, okay, let's listen to this, learn from it, do some stuff, uh, he just put it out. <laughs> yeah, which is insane. Now the cover is awesome. What a great LP cover with the stage dive. Yeah. It's like John stage diving. I don't think that's John. Who is it? To some dude? I don't remember now. But I remember there was there was a controversy. I think they picked that thing because it looked like John and they thought it was John. <laughs> well, I thought it was John. Yeah, it's, it's a it sick looking is. cover. It's a sick looking <laughs> cover. So it's four years later you guys do big rusty balls. And that's a a big change for LRP sound wise. And you yeah. guys are both playing. And so you have John coming on playing guitar. It sounds like you're Totally cool with that, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Adding yeah. to the sound. Yeah. How did he feel about you, like, singing some songs? I don't know. <laughs> I have a feeling he wasn't super happy about it. But basically it was he sung his songs and I sung my songs. So, yeah. so any song that John's singing, he pretty he wrote much it. wrote. Except for Jamie Just. Jamie Just, Jim wrote. And John singing. I a great song. song. Yeah, That's a great I song. I love that song. Yeah. And then uh, – Matter of fact, that's the one uh, that I wish we played. Well, it's never it too late. I know. Well, <laughs> how did you uh, meet Doctor Strange? Or how did that happen? That's a good question. Was he always like around in your circle a little bit? Not really. How did we meet Doctor Strange? He's a cool label. Oh, he no, put out Bill, some stuff I really like. Yeah, Bill is, and he's straight up too. Yeah. He uh, again off uh, that one album. He was he would send us every three months. He would send us a statement, uh, a check if there was anything associated with it, and tell you exactly the numbers. His record store is still really yeah. cool. Oh, it's yeah. there, and then uh, I love that Bull Weevils LP he put out. The Bull Weevils Heavyweight, the guitar yeah. tone on it is like probably my favorite ever. It's just so I don't know. So. And you know, and he did the first face to face. Sure. And because, well, it got re released. It's the same record that got re re released on Fat. Right. It's Don't Turn Away, right? Yes. And so he did it first, and we actually played a lot of shows with Face to Face when they were they we were on our downhill slide and they were on their uphill slide, so it was it was it was kind of weird. So he, but but we we played with them a lot and it was fun and stuff. And, but do you consider that downhill right after Big Rusty Balls? Like that's a good record. I love Big Rusty Balls. Um, it was different for us, so I think when I say downhill, I don't mean musically wise. I just think popularity wise. Yeah, but the scene like, is totally different then. Small. Yeah, the scene is totally different. Everything's everything's kind of in this weird transitional phase that nobody knew what they were doing. Yeah, which leads to the next record, which I love, and I've talked about several times on this podcast, which is the Bleed LP. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely love it. I think it's like a lot of times records I like are things that like you could no one could ever replicate it because they're not crazy enough. And so like that sound on that record is like, okay, you have like the no effects beat, like do that, do that, do that, do that with Libke playing as fast as he can, you know? And then you have like these, it's like these smooth, silky leads from like the Nachaya dude yeah, Nachaya. from Nachaya joystick. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, so you have this like, super new school music and then like your voice on it is amazing yeah so like 
really like a like a heartfelt like kind of throaty guttural you know like a kind of like a Leatherface a little bit. No, uh, it's a British band that like yeah I'll uh, I'll show you a text. There's an album Leatherface Mush is like one of my favorite punk. There was a there was a review where the guy compared uh, me to Mike Muir. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. that's a I'll stretch, it. <laughs> but it's like. It's like, I don't, know, I don't know. It's like, I guess it's like maybe like a Tom Waitsy voice, even like, okay. it's just, it's a wild, I, I love it because you have this like really gruff voice on top of like this really polished new school music of the time. And it's like, you couldn't replicate it again. Like, I don't think anyone could go in and like make something that sounds like that, you know? And those songs are so strong. Like that record is Fucking amazing. That that was actually a really, really fun record to write. Is we met in a shy. So Joey somehow met in a shy. It might have even been through an ad. Okay. Like we we decided to put together your reputed and it was me and Jim. For some reason I was thinking there was a third person in there because we still wanted to call it your repute because there was three of us. But somehow it before bleed, it dropped out to just me and Jim and Joey. And Joey was, yeah, he was, he was cool. Joey was all into the new school. He was into, you know, all the fat record stuff. Yeah, he is. you tell by all the logos he was <laughs> No, of course. He was trying to transition us into that. Yeah. And then me and Jim were the dinosaurs trying to still kind of hold off the thing. So it's, it was, it was kind of collaborating. But, uh, but when I met Ashaya and we started writing that album, he, it was so fun working with him because he was really talented yeah. and it was kind of new for me. And we would just, me and him would put our heads together and we would come up with, with all these different things that I just fucking had the best time. Yeah. And it was just, it was hitting me in my soul. And so that's really a, a soulful album. Heartfelt like bleed. The song bleed is one of my favorites. Yeah. I love that. Well, that record has my favorite punk lyric of all time on it, which is, Playing shitholes, staying at your house. Oh yeah, is that from I mean, Roots? Right? Yeah, it's from yeah, Roots. Yeah. And it's like, if like that sums up punk rock, <laughs> yeah. right? It's like that's touring. If yeah. you're in like a struggling punk or hardcore band, playing shitholes and staying at your house. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like I was saying in that earlier, exactly. song, you never stay at a hotel. You always yeah. just let people play to their play to their house. But uh, and, and that song too, Roots. It was funny because. Uh, like I said, Joey was really into that new school sound, and everybody was like throwing those little those little ska riffs mm-hmm. in. And so he was like, "Dude, dude, we gotta do a ska riff. We gotta, we gotta do a ska riff." And everybody's like, "No, no, no!" <laughs> and then so when we did it, we did it with kind of like tongue in cheek. Sure. If you listen to the lyrics sure. right there, it's kind of like like doing that is the lyrics to that little part is kind of like like selling yourself to corporate. Corp- yeah, to yeah. Sell out whenever I don't know. Yeah, and that's how it wraps up, right? We should move along and get the fuck on out. Yeah. Bam! Yeah. That, re- that record's a ripper. I wish it came out on vinyl. I think that, like, a lot of things are lost to history if they don't come out on vinyl. Because, like, it's, like, the format that never goes away. Where, like, I'm not old enough for 8-tracks, but 8-tracks came and went. Cassettes came and went. CDs came and went. Yeah. And like, I guess digital will be forever, but digital is like, it's just a sea of shit. Out there. Yeah. But, and, and uh, yeah, vi- vinyl's like that, uh, you know, it's the collector's item. It's the, it's, it's just kind of has a, a aura to it. Yeah. It has an authenticity and like, you know, during the years that it wasn't popular, it was held together by like real underground music. It was held together by hip hop and, and punk rock. Right. Yeah. So it's just like the, the everlasting format that will never go yeah, away. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it'll ever. No, you're right. Matter of fact, when I put out uh, Nardcore 30, yeah, uh, I told Doug, and and he was still CD, CD, CD. Yeah, and I go, dude, CD's a dying market. I go, this has to come out. I go, if we're gonna do this, it has to be on on LP. And uh, and I go, we'll put a CD in there. So I literally had everything put together, was ready to drive down either that day or the next day to Doug's, and. I'm super glad that he was honest with me this one point. He goes, Hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to release it on CD first. And then if it makes enough money, we're going to release it on the the vinyl. I go, dude, it's never going to come out on vinyl. If you do this, <laughs> I, go, I go, fuck it. I'm not coming. And he got all pissed off because he paid for half the artwork. Mm-hmm. Like at Brian Walsby did it for $200. I paid him a hundred and done. Paid him <laughs> 
And so he thought, like, you're fucking me. I paid for this record. And he didn't do anything but pay half of that. hundred bucks. A hundred bucks, bucks. To fucking Brian Walsby. So, uh, so yeah, I said no. And I, and I shopped it around and Jerome picked it up. But anyway, back to uh, what we talked about before. We're just talking about vinyl. And, and we can, oh, we can move on from it. Like, that layout on that Narco 30 years later is amazing like with that cd mounted inside yeah that's sick that was all jerome jerome had these great ideas and he you know he wanted 180 gram vinyl yeah like a thick collector's vinyl he wanted it the gatefold yeah and we're, and we're just like and i've seen some reviews just going wow this is an amazing fucking package I yeah like it was i that cd mounted in there it's like that was so brilliant because yeah, you're just straddling the yeah, and then the that formats. CD has has the album, so you never have to scratch up your album, right? And it extra also songs has too, right? An extra song from each band. Yeah, that's so cool. That was really that's that so cool. <laughs> so then, Nishaya left. Why did he leave the band? He he had his hands in all kinds of stuff, and he was really getting into swing. Okay. And stuff. So did he, he go do a swing that. band? Like, cause that he broke did. around he that did. time. He did it. It was kind of a swing, kind of like a throwback. Uh, there's another word for the band. Uh, speakeasy okay. type thing. And so, okay. you know, he'd wear the old timey yeah, stuff. Yeah. And it was good. And he did that for a while. And then I think, I don't, that's just, I don't even think he's in music anymore. Oh, what a shame. Yeah. Real shame. It's yeah. Good. And then you do, uh, you get Joe and Forrest. You do and now. Yeah, I don't even know how that came about, but we, you know, I just love playing and I just wanted to keep playing. And and now was mainly uh, mainly all four songs. I maybe wrote two, two, three songs on there. Yeah, but they were all a bunch of four songs, which he probably had for yeah, a long yeah. time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> one of the songs I <laughs> we get it recorded, we do everything, and then he goes, "Hey guys, I think the album like is in the pressing plan." In okay. The he goes, hey guys, I just realized I think this song sounds like a Dag Nasty song. And Dag Nasty, great band, great band, but I was never into them because I kind of, they came out, there was a period where, you know, I wasn't into it, any of the scene. I was doing my own thing. And, uh, and that, and there was this whole another wave. I like, punk rock kind of came in waves, you mm-hmm. know. And so Dag Nasty was in that wave. So I just didn't know anything about him. So I didn't know it was a Dag Nasty song. So we go, well, let's hear it. And he plays a song and it's fucking no for no this song. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the only saving grace was I wasn't familiar with Dag Nasty. So my Your vocals are way different. different yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, but that's funny coming from Forrest because it's obviously his number one influence. Yeah. Brian yeah. Brian Baker and that yeah, first Dag Nasty. It could have been one of those, what I, I like to call them uh, uh, Danny Partridge moments. Yeah. Yeah. There's this episode where, uh, Danny was a younger brother, right? Yeah, yeah. He was a little redhead kid. He's sleeping while Keith is writing a song in the room uh-huh. next door, and it goes into his brain while he's sleeping. So he wakes up thinking, I wrote this awesome song, <laughs> and it's really a song someone else wrote. So, I mean, who knows how many songs are, are actually like that, where you think you came up with a song, but it's something you heard somewhere. Yeah, and, you know, the vocals sitting on top of everything changes everything, right? Like, how many uh, songs were written in, like, the – the T formation, you know, a million songs. Yeah. And yeah. so it's all the vocals. So one of the best things about your repute and being a, a punk guy from Austin is you guys are a band that still plays and you're still awesome. Like, yeah, you. you know, a lot of older bands, um, it's rad that they're still out there playing because everyone should have fun. Right. And if, if you enjoy doing something, just do it and have fun and fuck it if you suck. Right. Yeah. yeah. But like you guys are still rippers, like Thanks. still like, uh, you know, like, I don't know, just everyone's proud that like our, our older band, like still rips, <laughs> you know, like you guys play, it's not embarrassing. It's like, this band is still fucking awesome. Yeah, thanks, you know, like how do you hold it together so well? Probably because we're not writing new stuff. <laughs> 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 I think that's what, you know, cause I think, you know, a lot of bands rip and stuff, and uh, I personally would like to write new stuff, but that's why I have other bands. Yeah. So I do all my new stuff there, and I just think if it would be come out with an album right now, it would be, it would be really fun, but maybe it would be that curse where yeah. you know, this is showing we don't rip anymore. So we just play the old songs. 
we still have the heart of those songs and, and we still like to play them as fast as, as we can. Yeah, and you're still all and, friends. Yeah, yeah, we're still all friends. Which is amazing. And, and you're still friends with Carl, even though Carl hasn't been in the band in, in a while. Yeah. Your, your new drummer has been in the band then, for 15 years. Yeah, so. yeah. And Carl was only in the band like five years. Or <laughs> yeah. whatever. But, uh, but, you know, Carl was like, you know, the heart and soul of, you know, repute in the beginning and stuff. And, you know, he gave us a unique sound, I think. Yes. Because, you know, we had the, the rock drumming kind of trying to learn how to play punk. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. If and if what I think is just me, Jim, and John, which are the original three, yeah. still playing today. So yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah, super cool. All right, Tony. Thanks so much. Do you feel like you've been represented well? Yeah, except I wanted to give a shout out to my new band, The Robot Uprising. All right, well, let's talk about it. Uh, talk about I mean, Robot Uprising. Yeah, so like I said, I've, I've got so songs that I wish I could do with Ill Repute. Well, not these songs so much because these kind of transitioned. But so I got my new bands, The Robot Uprising. Oh, I just want to talk about the North Brook Beer if I can. Yes, that's, let's do both. That's going to be amazing. So my new band, The Robot Uprising, we just released our album, The, the Uprising. But and it's funny, we were talking about this. Um, we released it on USB. Okay. But it's this little fucking metal robot. Oh, that's cool. USB. It's really cool. I mean, just the USB alone is worth is is worth the price. Yeah. yeah and it's a really cool little metal USB. It says the robot uprising on it. And it has our songs, an extra song that you can't get online on our release yet until someone puts it out there. And then our videos on there, a slideshow of all our flyers and lyrics and all stuff. So it's cool. It's a multimedia release. Yeah. And it's on this little robot. Uh, so USB. cool. So, That's, but I'm having a great time playing with these guys. We're kind of pushing. It's kind of punk rock. I, I really wanted it to be kind of uh, like old uh, proto-punk. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, to me, a band is the four members creating whatever they sure. get into. And so we got a young, this one guy, I call him young, he's 30. Yeah. He's the youngest guy in the yeah. band, so. So that is young. I'm 39 flavor. now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still feel like a new Jack. <laughs> so, so he gives it a whole new flavor. We get together and it's, it's in the vein of punk rock, but it kind of gets a little, you know, varied. Are you singing and playing guitar? Yeah. yeah I, I was singing and playing guitar. Then we, I put down the guitars. We got another guitar player. He didn't work out. And then I just never picked the guitar back up. So yeah. we just were a four piece, but just one guitar. Yeah. Um, so that's that. Robot Uprising. Look for us, please. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, and hopefully my sing is like what you were saying. I yeah. Well, do they have it at Salsers? I'll go buy it today. No. Like we just came out. Okay. Just, and actually, that's just a limited edition. I should have bought you one. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'll, um, I'll Google it. Um, and then you want to talk about the Nardcore beer. Yeah. So the big thing going on right now is the Nardcore lager. And I want to give shouts out to Josh Downs. Yeah. Because I've been hit up throughout the years to do a Nardcore beer. Yeah. And it's always these kind of startup beer companies and they see, you know, the our, my bowling tournaments and they see all this, the bands I've been in and they always go, oh, we want to come to you and we want to put out Nardcore beer. And I'm, and I'm always sure, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. And they go, okay, let's, uh, we're going to look into it a little bit. And then they never get back to me. Sure. It's not like we, we try something. So then this place, uh, that Josh knows, and Josh like got on this, and Casa Agria. I don't know if you're familiar with Casa Agria. They're here. The brew is actually in Oxnard. Yeah, and he's been like a, a beer guy for a while, right? He, yeah. He actually yeah. like went out to LA and was working at beer. Yeah, they have some. Who are you talking about, Josh? Josh. Yeah, Josh works at Smog City. Josh doesn't even work for these guys. Okay. But somehow he knows people there, and the people at Casa Agria are really cool. Awesome. And they love Oxnard. They mm -hmm. love the music and stuff and the scene. And they, they do some really good beers. Yeah. Really good lagers. And this coming out. So somehow they got together. Josh is the one who's who's responsible for keeping it alive and making it happen. And the unique – it's it's Casa Agria's first American lager. And okay. I, I don't know what that means. It's made here. Is, aren't they all American I lagers? Don't I don't know. I'm not a craft beer guy. But – uh but it's supposedly this is going to be the first American lager. It's going to be a Nardcore lager, lager, whatever. And the unique thing about this is we're getting as many people from bands from this area that can help out. And they're actually going to be there on brew day. Yeah, I got to figure out how to Help come. A Tuesday is so hard, though. You. If you can take a day off. Is it, is, is it this Tuesday? No, it's, it's, it's a a while May from now. 14th. Okay. I got to try to make it work. Yeah. 
Ryan, Ryan said he's going to be there. Yeah. He's going to control. He's going yeah. to retaliate. Yeah. So it's going to say, I mean, the, the can's going to have the sick artwork by this guy. He just did the Dad Braids cover. Okay. He did, uh, I think he did an album for Alice in Chains. And he's a really great artist. I see some other stuff named Donnie. And uh, so he's going to do this artwork. And any band that helps make it, it's going to be, you know, say on there, kind of like brewed by members of. Sure. You know, retaliate, yeah, yeah, yeah. make it, and control. All right, dude. We've got the pure, pressure on right? yeah. you know what I'm So we already got Ill Repute, Stalag, Dr. No, False Confession, yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera, Auxilio. I love that band. Yeah. How how fucking sick is that band? Yeah, they just got back from Peru. Oh, I know. I saw that. that. That's so cool. Yeah. Are any of the Rodders guys still alive? The Rodders, yeah, Fester. Okay, so one of them is alive. Yeah, a couple. Uh, um, one guy lives in Japan, the bass okay. singer. Uh, Fester is. Man, he was he guy. was serious about that buying Japanese goods. Yeah, huh? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's living it. And maybe he's saving the whales. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, no other way, sinking the whales. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but so Rod, yeah, yeah, Fester will be there. So the Rodders will be represented. Awesome. So. so it's actually going to be brewed by all the fucking yeah. Scene. All right, I'll fucking be there, yeah, dude. I can't to. not be there. To. Yeah, it's like the drive from San Diego to here is just a pain. Bet, You're yeah. passing through so many traffic. Potential. Anyway, that's boring for this. But so, <laughs> any, anything else you want to touch on? Uh, yeah, no, no, that's it. Okay, awesome. Thank, Thank you, you Tony. Thank you for being here. Appreciate for it. Me here.